Hi, I'm Eric Kaufman. I'm Assistant Professor of Oncology at Roswell Park, and my focus is in prostate cancer. And I'm Jim Moeller. I'm a Professor of Oncology at Roswell Park and Chair of the NCCN Prostate Cancer Guideline Committee. Uh, we're aware that prostate cancer is a very controversial topic. The more you learn about it, often the more confused you get. So we're here this morning, Dr. Kaufman and I, to answer some of your common questions. First question, how common is prostate cancer, Dr. Kaufman? Prostate cancer is very common. There's uh, almost 200,000 new cases diagnosed each year in the United States. Um, and uh, approximately one in around 10 people will be diagnosed with prostate cancer during their lifetime. All right, what are the warning signs of prostate cancer? So unfortunately, there aren't any, unless prostate cancer presents when it's already incurable. Then you might have pain in your axial skeleton. It's a very different kind of pain. It's a pain that comes, never goes away, and gets work e worse each day. Uh, some people also will present with a bladder outlet obstruction. They'll have difficulty passing their urine they may get up at night many times, four or more. They may have blood in their urine, and uh, they may become unable to void. What is the treatment for prostate cancer? So uh, most prostate cancers in men are found using early detection strategies. A lump develops in the prostate, or 10 years in advance of that, the PSA can increase. When prostate cancer is found using early detection, it is usually found when it's highly curable, and in fact, more than half of men present with the low-risk prostate cancer, for which the only treatment necessary is what's called active surveillance. It used to be called watchful waiting. Active surveillance can be used by most men to monitor their prostate cancer. The chance of ever converting to a need for treatment is only about 20% with low-risk prostate cancer. For treatment of higher-risk uh, prostate cancers, for which we think uh, active surveillance may not be the best option, treatment can be done either with operation with robotic radical prostatectomy, which is the removal of the whole prostate, and often with the surrounding lymph nodes that are removed at the same time. It's one of the first places that the prostate cancer can spread when it gets outside of the prostate. And then alternative to the operation is radiation that can be done either with the seed implants or with the conventional way of doing it, which is, we call external beam radiation. So how do you check for prostate cancer? We just touched on that. Yeah, Dr. Muller touched on this a minute ago. So as he mentioned, uh, most often prostate cancer, when it's confined to the prostate, isn't going to pre present with any symptoms. Uh, so it's really important in order to detect it early that men get screened regularly. This is done with an annual screening uh, that uh, typically starts at the age of 50 to 55 uh, for patients with a family history of uh, particularly in a brother or in a father than the age of screening needs to start at the age of 40. Also African Americans because they're high risk need to start at the age of 40. And what that screening involves is a PSA blood test and also a digital rectal exam to uh, palpate the prostate and feel for any abnormal nodules. And the two of these together have been shown to be the most effective combination for screening. PSA stands for prostate-specific antigen. Uh, it is the best early detection test among the entire cancer field, and yet it's very controversial. So PSA is made by the prostate, but it's also made by every other cell in a man and woman's body. So what we're really interested in is when the PSA becomes distinctly elevated or when a PSA measured annually increases. So we pay attention to what's called PSA kinetics or PSA velocity or doubling time, which is the change in PSA. So we're much more interested in changes in PSAs than what the PSA value is. That's called a snapshot PSA. And PSA can be elevated by many reasons that are not prostate cancer. It also, prostate cancer can occur 
in the face of a totally normal PSA. And unfortunately, those are more often the rapidly uh, progressing prostate cancers that can be, become metastatic. So that's why it's important to have a prostate exam in addition to a PSA. I think uh, Dr. Muller hit on a really good point that, I, that I'm asked a lot about is, is I've heard PSA doesn't work. And I think patients hear, hear that a lot and there is a lot of controversy over it. And, and what Dr. Muller really hit the nail on the head about is PSA doesn't work when it's interpreted uh, improperly. And it's not a black and white issue of is the number positive or negative. There's a lot more to it. We have to look at how it's changed over time, what other factors are going on in that patient's life that might elevate it that's not related to cancer. And there's a lot of uh, uh, expertise that needs to be, need to come in, in interpreting these. And when that's done, the PSA is uh, very effective in diagnosing the cancers, and particularly the cancers that need to be treated. Is prostate cancer hereditary? A very important question. Yeah, so prostate cancer appears to have a hereditary component. Uh, that doesn't mean all of them are hereditary. Uh, we know all of them have a genetic cause that is re a result of genetic mutations in the prostate, but we don't know if all those mutations are inherited or if some of them are just acquired during a lifetime to, due to exposures to carcinogens that we really don't have our finger on exactly what they are yet. Um, as we mentioned, the having a brother or a father approximately doubles your risk of uh, getting prostate cancer due to that hereditary component. So uh, you can think of this very simply that across all of the cancers, about 5% are genetic inherited, about 5% are purely environmental, and about 90% of them are a combination of the two, gene, environment, interaction. And that's why this is such a complicated subject. So in order to recognize men in whom prostate cancer more commonly might develop, we rely on their brother or father having a prostate cancer, especially under age 60 or 65. If a family member has died of prostate cancer, if you're an Ashkenazi Jew, if you're African American, or if you have certain inherited, known inherited genes that cause increased risk of cancer, the most common of which would be the BRCA1 and BRCA2 breast cancer genes. There's also a cluster of cancers called the Lynch syndrome that are basically cancers of the uh, colon and rectum that are associated with ovarian cancers, prostate cancer, bladder cancer, which also could increase your risk. Yeah, just to reinforce uh, what Dr. Moeller said, uh, I had mentioned that uh, having a brother or a father is, is a risk that, that doubles, or it doubles your risk for prostate cancer. Um, but as Dr. Moeller pointed out, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's hereditary. Um, what's more accurate is to look if that brother or father got the diagnosis at an earlier age. Um, as Dr. Moeller said, before 65, but even maybe more accurately, even before 60. Uh, the younger the father or brother was, the more likely that would have a hereditary component. And the other thing Dr. Muller mentioned was a, is a good take home is if, if your father or brother died from the cancer, that's, it's, you know, it's much less common for uh, patients to die from their prostate cancer, and the ones uh, that, that do lead to death are typically more, uh, that are more aggressive. Uh, tend to be more likely to have a hereditary component to them.